All right then, let's begin. I said last week that I didn't have quite enough time to uh, cover flowers in church, um, but I think we can do it justice tonight in one sitting, I hope. The first thing we need to ask ourselves really is why do we have flowers in church? Is it just to make things look pretty or do they actually have another role to play in the liturgy? Do they just give us aesthetic pleasure when we see them or is their significance more spiritual or maybe even mystical? Here's two examples of flowers in church. I think by the end of our evening, I hope that you'll be able to see why the arrangement of flowers in church on the left-hand side, though very pretty and very impressive, is not liturgically speaking very good. Whereas the flower arrangement on the right-hand side, though it might not look anywhere near as impressive, is liturgically good. Um, see if you can think about that for a little while and sort of guess why. Now, Christians are not the only ones to have used flowers for religious purposes. Flowers have played a really important role in uh, ancient religions, and they're used today in Hindu and in Buddhist and in Jewish and Muslim temples and synagogues and mosques. On the top there, you can see uh, the floral designs in a mosque in Turkey, where they're particularly fond of tulips. Uh, on the left, you can see these garlands of flowers around the Hindu god Ganesh. I'm not sure who it is on the left. Uh, and on the right there, you can see a pool of lotus flowers in front of the Buddha. In this particular picture, you can see uh, Shavut in, in a synagogue um, uh, with all of these garlands of flowers and uh, children um, taking part in the celebration of the Torah. Um, these flowers have been taken to represent deities or uh, certain figures, um, uh, religious features, religious values like faithfulness or purity. Uh, here is um, something that looks like an angel but is actually uh, a Greek goddess, I'm not quite sure which one, giving the laurel crown to a victor uh, at the Olympic Games. Another one has just received one over here on the right-hand side. Um, they're taken as signs of peace, uh, as signs of sacrifice or enlightenment or power even. And we're going to be exploring some of these themes when we consider the ways in which Christians traditionally have used flowers in their religious ceremonies. So let's begin in a very sensible spot, which is the Bible, for some clues, just so we get off to a good sound footing. In Genesis, the book of Genesis, as you remember, human beings are created to live uh, at first in a lush garden the Garden of Eden. So we can expect flowers and plants to be images in the Bible of paradise, of perfection, of beauty. Um, the book of Psalms, for instance, is full of references to plants and to flowers, as we discovered when we looked at reformed piety, for instance. Um, the, the book of Psalms is saturated with references to nature and the beauty of nature. Um, uh, here you can see Psalm 1, verse 3, uh, that sings about a just man who's compared to a tree uh, on the water's edge with its roots deep in the fertile soil. In Psalm 92, the just will flourish like a palm tree. Uh, they shall grow like the cedar of Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord. They shall flourish in the courts of our God. So we as, as God's people are compared to flowers and plants, to trees in this particular case. It doesn't stop there either. We can see in Psalm 52 verse 8, but I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. So these references are all through the Bible. Uh, in the temple in Jerusalem, I couldn't find a thrilling picture of this, but this one will have to do. Uh, the menorah itself is described in floral terms. This seven-branched candlestick uh, is described in the book of Exodus, and it says that the top 
of the, the thing which receives the candle, this little bit here, should be in the shape of an almond blossom, a blossom of an almond tree. Uh, in these reconstructions of the menorah, uh, very often you can see that it's supposed to look like a tree, rather, uh, and the floral references to it uh, are all over the place there. Uh, according to 1 Kings chapter 6, uh, verse 18, Solomon decorated the temple with these cedar wood planks that were carved uh, in the shape of gourds and open flowers. Uh, so the temple itself was decorated with floral images, um, even though we remember from the Ten Commandments there was an injunction not to make a graven image of anything above or below or under the earth. Clearly, the instructions given in the book of Exodus for the temple itself are full of references to floral uh, motifs and uh, nature motifs. Um, the high priest Aaron was instructed to wear a robe that was fringed with little bells and pomegranate uh, um, fruit. Uh, so there again we have a reference to nature cropping up in the way that the temple was organized and arranged and decorated. Um, the longed for promised land actually after the Babylonian exile is described as we know at this time of year during um, during Advent, it's described as this arid desert that suddenly bursts into blossom uh, and streams of living water flow through it uh, to welcome the returning exiles. Uh, other biblical passages emphasize the frailty of human beings and compare that to flowers. And here you can see uh, in 1 Peter 1 verse 24, uh, Peter is quoting here um, a passage of Isaiah. All people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall. Um, the, book of, uh, 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 the book of Proverbs, for instance, and the Song of Songs, if you read through that, uh, they're full of references to plants and flowers and fruit, with the beloved being compared uh, to a series of different flowers uh, during, uh, in the Song of Songs. Um, the flower of the root of Jesse, uh, here you can see in Chartres on the left-hand side, uh, is Jesus himself. So Jesus is compared to a flower. Here he is at the top of the tree of Jesse uh, with his ancestors uh, on the various branches of the tree. Uh, the original of the family tree. Uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us to look at the lilies of the fields. Even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And many of his parables draw on nature uh, uh, for their illustrations. Now, since the Old and the New Testament speak so much about plants and flowers, uh, the liturgy can't just simply disregard them. In fact, in the earliest church, uh, here you can see we've looked at some of these pictures before in the catacombs. We've looked at them in reference to the Christian meal. But look at the decorations around these early pictures. You can see their flowering tendrils, sometimes of palm branches, sometimes of vines. Um, so you can imagine that perhaps even though we don't have any surviving depictions of this, these early Christian meals in these um, uh, dining rooms uh, were full of flowers. The Romans and the Greeks, in fact, uh, used flowers as part of their uh, entertainment um, um, ideas, uh, filling the room where people ate with flowers either scattered on the ground or uh, painted onto the walls or attached to the walls or in vases around the room. Here again you'll see uh, another image from the catacombs with these floral motifs all around here. Here's uh, clearly Jesus on a throne in the center of the thing and these people bringing garlands uh, in their hands on the right hand side here uh, and various flowers on, uh, arranged around and about. I thought at first that they were kebabs, um, <laughs> but if you look a little bit more carefully, uh, you can see that the, some of them are individual flowers here that are peppered around and about. So we're presuming that these are garlands of flowers uh, that were used to de decorate these early Christian gatherings. 
Um, the olive branch, too, is painted as a symbol of uh, God's peace and a symbol of God's promises. In the earliest Roman churches, the columns of these churches, uh, capitals, are carved with these rich plant motifs here taken uh, from Greek and Roman architecture. Here they are at the top here. Uh, you can presume that if they're here in stone, they probably would have been um, used to decorate the churches as well, to pass garlands between the, brand, uh, to, between the columns here for great festival times of year. Um, St. Augustine speaks of a cherry in one, one of his uh, reading, uh, one of his passages, and he talks about the symbolism of the cherry in churches. The pit, the little wooden pit of the cherry is the wood of the cross, uh, and the flesh of the cherry, the red flesh of the cherry, symbolizes the blood of Christ on the cross. The olive also uh, comes into a symbol of, you, you remember the dove returns with the olive branch in its mouth. We saw a picture of that earlier on. Uh, early Christian tradition says that Christ was crucified on a cross that was made of olive wood. And in fact, um, some remains that have been found uh, of uh, nails in, these, um, uh, in um, the tombs of people who've been crucified with a tiny little bit of olive wood attached still to the nail. So the symbolism of the olive is a very strong one there and is a reflection between the olive branch of the dove and Christ bringing peace to humanity on the olive wood cross. Um, the most perfect examples of these floral motifs come from these Gothic cathedrals, palms and roses and lilies and ears of wheat and vines and branches appear in profusion. On the left-hand side here, I believe this is the rose window in Notre Dame. We'll be talking about the association of Mary, the mother of Jesus, with the rose and the lily. And on the right there, you have a little Gothic capital uh, covered with oak leaves and uh, what might be a hellebore perhaps or lilies and various different things. These, these flowers and uh, trees and leaves appear all over these Gothic cathedrals. It's also the case, as we've seen in medieval Bibles. Oh, here is uh, King's College, Cambridge, uh, with the roof of the whole thing uh, being depicted as a great forest, these great branches stretching up. Uh, from the um, from the capitals here along the sides of the walls. When we looked at medieval Bibles, we discovered that they were full of these images of flowers. And I said at the time uh, that there's more to this than meets the eye. They weren't doing this just to be pretty. If you notice on these two pictures, they have various things in common. They're not from the same book. But you can see, first of all, many of the flowers around here are blue, um, little forget-me-nots and what have you. Uh, and these little uh, elaborate scrolls here are all blue as well. And here we have what looks like a raspberry, but I, I think it's actually a three-petaled flower. Uh, the, the blue color evoking Mary's color, the color of the robe in which traditionally she was supposed to have given birth to Jesus. But look at something else. It's not all blue. Can you see the strawberry? There's a strawberry at the bottom here, see that? And two strawberries down here. And you're thinking, why suddenly stick a strawberry in there? As, is this a medieval whimsy? Well, actually, this strawberry is intended to symbolize the fruitful virgin. See the contradiction in that expression? A fruitful virgin. Surely... Um, uh, before you can bear a child, you have to stop being a virgin. Uh, but with Mary, the fruitful virgin, that wasn't the case. So they were looking for a flower or some sort of symbol that would work for this, and they came across the strawberry. Why the strawberry? Well, because the strawberry plant, if you've ever grown one or seen one, you can see it will bear flowers and fruit at the same time. The flowers are white uh, that symbolize Mary's innocence and purity, and the bright red fruit of the strawberry uh, symbolizes uh, God's uh, son, Jesus, and his redeeming death uh, on the cross. 
So this strawberry is there for very specific reasons. It's not just a little whimsy of the decorator who thought perhaps we needed a bit of red in this picture. So if we are going to use these flowers in, uh, and fruit and branches and what have you in our worship, we have to make them an integral part of the liturgy, not some sort of optional pretty filler. And after we sort of looked very briefly here, we can make the following observations. Flowers can be used as symbols. They can be used as symbols of paradise, uh, symbols of eternal bliss, uh, symbols of virtue, symbols of the transience of life, as we saw the grass withers and the flower fades. Secondly, flowers are in the church to remind us that the whole of nature is implicated in the redeeming work of Christ. This is what I mean. It's not just human beings here. Remember in Romans 8, one of the most famous passages in the Bible, what now can separate us from the love of Christ, right in the middle of Paul's letter, this great triumphant chapter 8, he says, creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And interestingly, in that same passage, we are described as the first fruits of the Spirit. So these flowers are in church to remind us that God's redeeming work doesn't stop with human beings in Christ. It implicates the whole of the created order, all of nature itself. Then we can say the following things. The language of flowers, which we'll look at in a minute, uh, often complements the immobility of the architecture of churches. Churches can look very stiff and staid. You know, the traditional shape of them, the cruciform shape of them, the static altar at the front, the static uh, seats in wood or in stone. Um, flowers give a sort of dynamism, a life, a movement. They make a place come alive, as we know when we buy flowers for our own homes. Um, and they have this ability, the flowers do, to represent very appropriately uh, the different feast days of the church or the changing cycles of seasons that you'll find in nature and in the liturgy as well. So in the spring, you'll see spring flowers. In the fall, you'll see fall flowers at Christmas time. Uh, you'll see evergreens. So these flowers represent the, the movement of, of, of the seasons, both in nature and in the liturgy. Now, here's an interesting point. Cut flowers like candles and everything else around the altar are consumed. That is, they're either eaten or they're burned or they will fade and wither away. They're depleted. They fade. And they're there to remind us of Christ's sacrifice. They're symbolic offering, yes, but they're a real offering too because they pass away. They go away. Uh, that's why artificial flowers or fake candles are disapproved of in churches. They don't symbolize the same fact that, that the altar is there to represent the fact that something is being consumed, something is being broken in order to make us whole. Uh, so it evokes this, this sacrifice. Flowers are very good for that. Um, and finally, these um, people often donate money expressly to buy flowers, either in thanksgiving for some happy event in their lives, an anniversary or a, a, a birthday or something, uh, or to commemorate a loved one who's passed away, as we've seen over the last uh, few weeks for All Saints Sunday and, and various other Sundays in the church's year. After Marjorie died, we bought some uh, pink roses that she was particularly fond of. So there they are, symbolizing those people who've passed away too, or uh, being a way for lay people also to participate in that offering around the holy table, something that they themselves have brought to the church uh, as an offering, um, and, and they see uh, it being used in the liturgy in this particular way. So from the, these little points that we've made, it's clear that the placement 
of these flowers and the arrangement of these flowers is going to be significant. It's not going to be thoughtless. Like any other adornment in church, flowers and plants should not ignore or detract from the symbolic and the theological meaning of sacred space or sacred furnishings. They draw attention to the places that they're put in. They don't just draw attention to themselves. They're supposed to hi uh, highlight rather than hide the altar or the pulpit or the baptismal font. And I can tell you, after years of experience in the ministry, that the biggest crimes in flower arrangement happen at weddings. The flowers here are highlighting the bride. That's the whole point of what you're seeing here uh, in front of you. They've spent a great deal of money on this, but is that an altar there? Is it? Or, or is it a stand for flowers? Or, or is it something that you're going to put the book on or, or, the, or the ring on? Um, what's, what's, what's going on exactly here? What's, what's the liturgical significance of this? Well, the significance of it is it's going to make the bride's dress really pop. So here's an example of flowers really drawing attention to themselves or drawing attention to something that isn't the point of the service. The point of the service is the, uh, the, the, the sacrament of marriage, the, the celebration of a marriage between the bride and the groom and uh, becoming a, a symbol of Christ's love uh, for, the, for the church, uh, not an end in themselves. Flowers also should reflect the hierarchy of what's most important in a church. So for instance, it's quite wrong to have more flowers adorning the statue of a patron saint or something, or the bishop's seat, for instance, than you would find around the altar. If there are more flowers around the bishop's seat, or more flowers around Saint Aloysius of the some, something or other, it's clear that that's where you're putting all your importance. This is an interesting example of this, because here you've got a great bank of flowers in front of the Virgin Mary, um, so much so that they've sort of overflowed here behind the altar, uh, and then a few bodged in front of the altar and a couple of sad little ones stuck behind here. So this is an example of where you're looking and you're wondering quite what's happening. I, I mean, it's lovely, it's beautiful, and it's very devotional, uh, but technically speaking, we're, we're looking at something that seems to be putting more emphasis on the Virgin than what is about to happen on the altar in terms of Jesus. What do we think of this picture? Immediately we can see here that we have to do perhaps with a Baptist church or something like that. What do we think of the flower arrangements? What are they drawing attention to? What's, what's the purpose of them here? Well, they're drawing attention to the music uh, that is about to be played here. And take a very careful look at this. It's obviously an autumnal flower arrangement. This, I think, is the table where communion maybe will be celebrated and the offerings will be brought up. You see, here are the offering plates. But they've decided that really the thing that they want to do is to raise your eye here to the word, to the preacher. It's an example of a flower arrangement being used to emphasize something that this church believes to be extremely important. More important than what might happen on the table is what is happening up here and the flower arrangement has been composed to fill that space in a really significant way. They probably weren't thinking of that when they did it. Uh, maybe not, or maybe they were. That's fine if that's, that's the expression of, their, of, of how they believe that the ranking or the importance happens in a church. Uh, that's, that's, that's one of the messages that it's conveying. Um, Flower arrangements are not normally placed on the altar itself for this reason. The altar has a unique honour of its own, and it doesn't need any flowers on it 
to draw attention to what it is or what it's for. Also, flowers on the altar itself uh, are a nuisance. Uh, they get in the way of what you're trying to do. However big the altar might be, um, they become a hazard. And you're constantly terrified that you're going to knock them over uh, when you're moving stuff around on the altar uh, for communion. Um, there's that famous play by, what's his name? Love, Love Among the Lentils or something about the, about the, the vicar's wife. Uh, and uh, she falls out with the altar guild because she says to one of the members of the altar guild, that's not a flower arrangement, it's a death trap. Meaning, you know, the vicar is going to fall over it and break his neck. Now, before we look at a few of these plants and flowers in a bit more detail, let's remind ourselves of what we already know about flowers. A Christmas tree, or here for Christmas trees, uh, a wreath of evergreens or a poinsettia plant automatically puts us in mind of the Christmas season. It's a sort of visceral reaction when we see this. What we're going to do is look a little bit more closely at the symbolism of the Christmas tree and the evergreens and the wreaths and things uh, to see if we can get a little bit more out of it than a visceral reaction that we've got to start stirring up Christmas puddings, write cards and buy presents. Um, lilies make us think of Easter or perhaps the Virgin Mary. In fact, we've come to call this plant the Easter lily. So that's a very strong association in our minds uh, too. Um, what does this make you think of? Well, it doesn't make, it's clear, clear what it makes us think of. Here are chrysanthemums being laid in cemeteries. We'll look at those in a little bit more detail in, in a while. Uh, autumn cemeteries, chrysanthemums. Uh, roses, this is actually a church flower arrangement. Uh, roses make us think of love. St. Valentine, the love of the Virgin, uh, weddings, perhaps. How about that? Here's, here's a bit of greenery uh, in St. Patrick's hand. Uh, the shamrock, or the, the clover leaf, uh, puts us in mind of the Trinity. So we do have some associations in our mind uh, between certain flowers and certain liturgical ideas or even theological ideas or devotional uh, ideas. Um, this particular flower here is called a passiflora. Some of you may be familiar with this. A passion flower. Why is it called that? Well, because... Here you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, we've only got ten of them. Uh, I thought there were twelve. They were supposed to symbolize the apostles, but perhaps not. Uh, this wibbly bit around the outside, the, pe the petals, are supposed to symbolize the crown of thorns. Uh, here, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, they symbolize the five wounds of Christ. That is to say, the two wounds in the hands and feet and the one wound in the side. And finally, you have these three pistils here that symbolize the three nails that, uh, go into, um, uh, that went into his hands uh, and his feet. So Christians through the ages have looked at these plants. This was particularly the case in the medieval period, as we saw with the strawberries, to say that nature itself is another Bible. God has uh, brought these things about in order to teach us something. So we should never just look at a flower and say, it's just a flower, uh, or a, a plant and say, it's just a plant. It carries with it a message that God has put there at the moment of, of creation and is, is a glory of God and exists for its own sake and in its own right uh, as a hymn of praise to God with all of these latent qualities in it. We might not be aware of the religious significance of a tulip, for instance. Uh, have you noticed that if you've bought uh, tulips and they're a little bit tired 
uh, and you pop them in a vase of water, they all flop over in a way that's almost impossible to arrange. But if you've left them in the vase for a little while, their heads will perk up and they'll try and grow upwards as you've seen for this one here. These ones are on their way. These ones are just waking up. Uh, this one has made it and so have they. Well, the tulip is often thought of as the praying plant because at first it bows its head in prayer, um, but then it will always try to grow upright, to grow upwards. So each of these plants probably has some sort of association uh, for us. And one of the things that we're going to try and do now is to deepen our appreciation of those associations and try to understand them a little bit better. Let's start with the Christmas tree. We probably already know that the tradition of decorating an entire evergreen conifer tree uh, originated in Germany and it was introduced into England, for instance, by Albert, uh, the Prince Consort of Queen Victoria. Uh, before that time, in England and in France, uh, branches were taken indoors to decorate the house during the winter, but just branches, not a whole cut uh, tree. Uh, here on the left, you can see an illustration of Queen Victoria, uh, Prince Albert with his little moustache over here, uh, decorating the Christmas tree, I think, at Windsor Castle uh, in the 1830s or something. I can't remember quite when. Um, the Germans actually brought the tradition to North America in the late 1700s. So Christmas trees arrived in America, in, in North America, before they arrived in England. Um, the Roman church tended to resist the custom of the Christmas tree because they thought it was very Lutheran. And the Vatican, in fact, had a Christmas tree for the first time in 1982. That might be a surprising thing for us to hear. Uh, Catholic families would be more likely to decorate their homes with a crib scene, a little creche at Christmas time, rather than a Christmas tree. This, uh, this is not the 1982 Christmas tree. I tried to find a picture of it, but it was nowhere to be found. It was cut down somewhere in Italy. That's all I could find out about it. Uh, here we have another little uh, picture. This, uh, well, I don't know where it's from. Various explanations have been given uh, regarding the origins of the Christmas tree. Where did it come from? What was it all about? Is it supposed to represent the tree of paradise, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? In the medieval period, these passion plays around Christmas uh, would often have a tree that was decorated with apples that represented the forbidden fruit. You might be thinking, well, why, why is this associated with Christmas? Well, there was a period in which people believed that uh, Adam and Eve's birthday was the same as the birthday of Jesus. So the tree was associated both uh, with Adam and Eve, obviously, and now with Jesus, who was born on the same day. Um, these apples that were on this medieval tree uh, that was uh, used to celebrate at that time uh, were later replaced by round objects, like sort of red, shiny balls, uh, at the origin of our uh, Christmas tree decorations, for instance. Oops. Here's another legend about the origin of the Christmas tree. Was it chosen because it's an evergreen, for instance, and particularly suited to remind us of eternal life, uh, since its leaves or its needles never drop? So you can use any fir tree, any uh, conifer uh, as a Christmas tree, provided it's an evergreen tree. Here's St. Boniface. St. Boniface was an English Saxon missionary to Germany. Uh, he was responsible for the conversion uh, of the Saxons in Germany to Christianity. He famously cut down a sacred oak tree in this little grove. Uh, and when it, it was a tree, I think, that was sacred to Thor, perhaps I'm wrong about that, uh, the, the, do, the begins with a D, the something oak. When it fell, it crushed all of the other trees uh, around it, apart from a little fir tree 
that simply bent and then sprung upright. So all of the other trees were crushed by this falling oak, but the good old fir tree uh, was more resilient and uh, it survived the felling of, 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 the, of the oak. This little evergreen tree grew in the place of the felled oak and its triangular shape reminds humanity of the Trinity and it points us all to heaven. So there's another little legend about the origin of the, of the Christmas tree. So uh, is that what we think of when we see that? It doesn't really remind me of the Trinity. I don't know why I've never made that association, but, uh, but there it is. Uh, it certainly points upwards, in this case, to the rainbow room rather than heaven, maybe. But it's a, it's a sprightly little thing. It's interesting that the, the um, branches of a Christian, uh, Christian tree, uh, of a Christmas tree, uh, fall downwards, not uh, upwards. Um, this, this Christmas tree, I keep flicking forward, uh, the Christmas tree um, traditionally would be put up on Christmas Eve and then taken down on Twelfth Night. That's the night of January the 5th through the 6th. Uh, Epiphany is on the 6th of January. Uh, although some Christian countries actually leave their Christmas trees up until Candlemas, that's February the 2nd, that's the Feast of the Presentation of Christ in the Temple. Uh, there's a story that what you're supposed to do, Candlemas is a, a quarter day. That is to say, it's exactly halfway between the winter solstice and the spring equinox. And uh, it was associated in the past with bonfires in pagan religion, uh, so that people um, in some countries would drag their Christmas tree outside at Candlemas and set fire to it. Uh, because the winter was drawing to a close. Let's talk for a minute about poinsettias. Here's one growing wild uh, in Mexico. It's probably the most popular Christmas plant, I would say. Uh, it's a common wild flower in Mexico, and the Aztecs used the leaves uh, to make dyes for clothes and to make cosmetics. Uh, they also used the sap of the poinsettia uh, medicinally. These leaves, the green leaves, they sort of come out in the shape of a star. The, 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 what we call the flower of the poinsettia is actually just that those little berries in the middle here. Uh, these are bracts, they're leaves, they're not flowers, these red bits of it. But you can see from this that the leaves, when they're green, uh, attend, uh, are intended to symbolize uh, the star that led the wise men to Jesus. And the red leaves, uh, obviously, are a reminder of the blood that Christ shed during his crucifixion. Uh, sometimes they come out white. There's a white variety of them, too. And when they're white, they're, te uh, they're taken to symbolize or represent Christ's purity. Very often, these poinsettias are placed very strategically at the foot of the altar here. I think this must be an instruction manual for, um, uh, for an altar guild and preparing for a Christmas Day service because we've got little words down at the bottom where people are supposed to sort of stand. And here are the, uh, here are the wise men, look, on their way to the creche, which is somewhere else in the picture. So uh, when, it, when these poinsettias, these red poinsettias, flood the base of the altar, uh, it's intended to sort of evoke what's happening on the altar in the Eucharist, uh, the commemoration of the shedding of Christ's blood uh, on the cross. There's rather a nice legend attached to the poinsettia uh, and its relationship to Christmas time, and it involves the story of a little girl by the name of Pepita. Uh, she had no present to offer the baby Jesus at the Christmas Eve service. And as she walked along to church, she noticed some weeds growing by the side of the road. Um, there you go. And at the urging of an angel, she gathered a bouquet of these weeds. And when she laid them at the feet of the Christ child, uh, the weeds burst into these bright red flowers. 
Um, and from then on, uh, the poinsettia became known as Flores de Noche Buena, the flowers of the holy night or the, the good night. Uh, you can see where the legend might have come from, actually, because generally speaking, poinsettias are green and they only turn red at certain times of the year, Christmas time. So uh, the, the leaves do turn red. They've been associated with this jolly little legend. People do horrible things to poinsettias, like spray them with glitter because they think they don't look interesting enough. Have you come across this? I, d I hope it's a trend that has withered and died, uh, just like the poor old poinsettias that this atrocity was perpetuated on, that, that were perpetrated on. Um, I haven't noticed any of them with the glitter on this year, but uh, it's early days. There you can see poinsettias uh, that are either turning red or turning back to green. People mostly throw them away when they begin to lose interest in them in late January. Uh, we try and keep them going in church for a good long period of time. Uh, I've only succeeded in doing this once, but if you nurture a poinsettia all summer long through the boring green phase when the red disappears, then you throw them in a dark cupboard in October when you take them out again in early December, you'll see that the top leaves have turned red. Now, people don't normally associate the poinsettia with the resurrection, but you can grow the plants every year if you put them away for a while in a dark place that evokes the tomb. And when they come out, they're red and ready to celebrate Christmas. And perhaps the message of a poinsettia, partly, is also that no matter what happens to you, shut away in a dark place during the COVID period, uh, Christ will be there and you will emerge glorious and uh, suffused with new colour. <laughs> Bit of a stretch, but there you go. <laughs> we tend to think of the lily as symbolic of Jesus' resurrection. You can see them arranged here at the foot of the altar. They have this sort of distinctive trumpet shape uh, that you can see represented in stained glass windows, either uh, in memory of somebody or, or actually to signify hope or, or purity or everlasting life. Here you can see they're drawing attention to the altar here at the back, and here they're drawing attention to the paschal candle on, on the left uh, here sort of trumpeting the resurrection. Now, lilies in Greek mythology were a symbol of Hera, who was the queen of heaven and the great mother goddess of, of Greek mythology. Um, here you can see her on the left uh, with Prometheus uh, um, holding this sort of acanthus lily uh, staff. On the right-hand side, you can see her inventing the Milky Way. Uh, it was supposed to be the milk that came from Hera's breast, uh, scattered over the, uh, uh, over the sky. Now, because of this strong association with the mother goddess par excellence uh, of pagan mythology, the lily became associated with the Virgin Mary. Uh, Renaissance paintings often show the angel Gabriel presenting Mary with white lilies while delivering the news that she was going to give birth to Jesus. So here you can see on the left the angel Gabriel uh, raising a hand in blessing and, uh, with, a, uh, with a lily in, uh, in his hand. On the right hand side you can see the pot of lilies growing at Mary's feet uh, here uh, with God peering through the clouds and the Holy Spirit coming down on Mary uh, here, a sort of Trinitarian reference here, and the angel wings covered in peacock feathers. Tradition also claims that lilies sprang up in the Garden of Gethsemane after Jesus prayed there before his betrayal and death. Wherever his tears fell, uh, the lilies grew. Um, there's also a legend that after Mary died, or was assumed, or fell asleep, uh, white lilies were found in her empty tomb. 
if you look closely at a lily, oops, we've gone on to a something else here. Did I have a close-up photo of a lily? Maybe earlier on. We're going to have to look at this. If you look closely at a lily, you'll see that the petals of a lily are sort of semi-transparent. They're quite sort of fleshy. And this is supposed to symbolize uh, Mary's uh, purity these petals and the uh, the golden anthers inside lilies that people often chop off because they tend to smell very strongly and if you brush against them uh, they're going to leave a saffron like stain on whatever you're wearing these golden anthers in the heart of the lily represent uh, Mary's soul here's a little here's a little poem somewhere while the Easter lilies swing their perfumed censers white, softened rays of sunlight falling in lines aslant and warm and bright shall gild the altar, nave and chancel. Rest with tender roseate ray on the font, enwreathed with lilies for baptismal rites today. Another pilgrim on their journey from cradle to the tomb shall receive a name and a blessing while the Easter lilies bloom. A bit sentimental, but it sort of conjures up this idea that wherever Easter lilies are, uh, their baptism is celebrated because of, the, because of the Easter season. Now, in some countries, chrysanthemums, in France, in Belgium, in Italy, Spain, Poland, amongst them, this incurved chrysanthemum, can, can you see this chrysanthemum flower? The, it's interned. Can you see the petals are turning in on themselves? It's not sort of opening up. This interned chrysanthemum uh, represents death or symbolizes death. And it's used only for funerals or on graves. I, I remember my Maternal grandfather, uh, grandmother didn't like these interned chrysanthemums because of their association uh, with cemeteries. But she was quite happy to have other sorts of chrysanthemums around that weren't interned. See how these things are sort of splaying outwards? They're not sort of coming in on themselves like this interned uh, uh, purple-looking chrysanthemum here. Um, in the USA, actually, the chrysanthemum is often thought of as a very positive, a very cheerful plant, unless you're in New Orleans, uh, where this association with death and the chrysanthemum uh, has, has continued. Let's think for a minute about different seasons of the church's year and how flowers uh, are used in those seasons. There's one season in the church's year where flowers don't make an appearance at all, uh, and that's the season of Lent. Uh, churches are very often decorated with branches like this here, uh, uh, those purpley looking stones at the bottom of it, uh, but never fruit and never flowers. And I suppose this is intended to remind us that it's a season of repentance, a season of preparation, a sort of solemn season of the year. And when the church sort of bursts into flower for Easter, uh, it's all the more inspiring, all the more hopeful. The fifth Sunday of Lent is an exception to this, uh, and it's an, a temporary respite from Lenten rigor. In England, and now at Saint Esprit somewhat, mm. uh, it's actually Mother's Day or Mothering Sunday, uh, and daffodils are used to decorate the church, and they're distributed traditionally to the mothers in the congregation at the end of the service. We give them out to, to everybody. As you can see, a daffodil flower is shaped a little bit like a trumpet, and it's supposed to serve as a sort of herald uh, uh, that goes before to remind us that something spectacular is about to happen in a few weeks' time. Uh, it's a nice little tradition. It's Mothering Sunday for a couple of reasons. The collect for the day in the old prayer book refers to Mother Church, and it was traditional on that Sunday uh, to give maids, uh, live-in maids, the, the day off so that they could go and visit their mothers or their family uh, before they were required to remain with their employers for the Easter season uh, to cook the lamb and do the various other bits and bobs. I'm sure that that's the case anymore. 
On Palm Sunday, uh, the church is decorated with palm branches, as we know, uh, or whatever greens might happen to be growing in your particular area. Uh, these palm branches represent Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And the victor's palm is often depicted in art, and it will be carried by a martyr, evoking that passage in the book of Revelation, if you remember, where the martyrs for, for Christ are seen in heaven with palm branches in their hands, another reference to trees and flowers and plants uh, in the Bible, in the book of Revelation. And in countries where palm branches are particularly difficult to find, uh, they're often replaced with branches of native trees like boxwood or olive or willow or even yew tree branches. Yew trees uh, have a distinctive little red berry. And I believe in France the name changes, does it, Joris, between the north and the south, where in the south it's called Dimanche des Rames des, des Palmes, des, and in the north it's Dimanche des Rameaux. Yeah because in the north, I think, um, buis, buis, uh, boxwood is used uh, instead. That's what we did last year, because all of the shops were closed due to the COVIDs. Uh, so I chopped some boxwood off the roof garden, and I've kept it. It's still around. Uh, so if, um, if uh, Ash Wednesday comes before our return, I'll be burning them all on our behalf. Uh, so these palm branches are burned on Ash Wednesday and then the ashes are imposed on people's foreheads if they want it uh, to mark the start of Lent. Um, very often these branches are, are um, taken home and then turned into elaborate designs like crosses or roses as we know at Saint Esprit. Uh, we've learned various techniques for making these palm branches uh, into bookmarks or little decorations that we can use throughout the year. The palm branches often stay in the church for Holy Week, uh, but on Maundy Thursday, the branches sometimes become a part of the altar of repose um, or the garden of repose. This is a very fancy one here. Um, this is a little altar, a temporary altar very often, that's intended to represent the garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus prayed before his betrayal. What happens is that the... Uh, host that was consecrated earlier on in the Thursday service uh, is placed in a chalice or a pyx and then it's taken in procession to this little altar where it remains until the close of the service at midnight. Um, it was a tradition in some churches to visit as many gardens of repose as possible in one evening and say a different prayer in different churches in a sort of procession. Uh, as you sat in silence uh, accompanying Jesus like the disciples accompanied Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane um, uh, before Judas and the soldiers arrived. On Good Friday, there are no flowers and no branches in the church of any kind. Even the cross in the church, uh, the wooden cross in the church is hidden on Good Friday uh, until the moment in the Good Friday liturgy where it's uh, taken out for the prayers. There's some controversy about flowers in the church in Advent. Some people don't like it at all because they think of Advent as a season of preparation for Christmas, a little bit like Lent. Uh, we talked a couple, uh, last week, I think, uh, and the week before about the season of Advent, uh, how it has this Two, two natures. Uh, it feels like uh, a season of preparation uh, for, for, for Christmas, of expectation and hope, but it also feels slightly penitential because of its long association with a penitential period in the church to prepare people for baptism at Epiphany, when Jesus himself uh, was baptized. That's the celebration of Jesus' baptism uh, during the season of Epiphany. So some people don't like flowers in the church for that reason. Uh, others might permit evergreens or even poinsettias. And still others, like we're doing at Saint Esprit at the moment, uh, might choose flowers that match the liturgical color of purple. Now purple is an interesting color because it tends to recede. So it doesn't come for you. 
So here on the left, can you see this effect? You've got uh, here some purple thistles and some something red that I can't identify uh, and a lot of greenery around here. But purple tends to, to sort of go back. It sort of, uh, it doesn't come out to meet you. It's, it's a receding color. There's a lot of books that are, that are written about what flowers to put together with each other so that they sing more or pop more. So if, if for instance, there was some yellow in this flower arrangement, the first thing that you would notice is the yellow, and the next thing that you might notice is how it forms such a great contrast with the purple. But there's no yellow in this arrangement, so people would call it a more receding arrangement, a quieter arrangement, uh, a, an arrangement that doesn't come out and shout at you. Um, perhaps an appropriate thing for Advent. Here on the right in Advent, there you can see the Advent wreath on the left, and here you can see very simple flower arrangements that have been chosen for the season of Advent with once again a slightly receding pinky purple color to them. I have a question, Nigel. Yes. For the last Sunday, for the last Sunday of Advent, which is usually associated with, to Mary, do you change the flower arrangement? Yes, I tend to do that. We tend to decorate the church a little bit early because of Chanton Noël. Okay. Uh, that's some churches put their Christmas tree up on the first Sunday in mm -hmm. Advent, uh, but we do it on the Saturday before Chanton Noël, uh, which is coming up on Tuesday. Uh, so, yes, the flowers will change. I'll keep purple flowers for this coming Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the last Sunday in Advent, uh, the flowers will change um, for the, for the uh, Annunciation and for the story of Mary. Yeah. Poppies. Um, these poppies arranged or worn in churches in England and elsewhere for Remembrance Sunday. This is because of the Flanders fields uh, where m many soldiers died, and, well, were massacred basically on all sides uh, during the First World War for the sake of empire. And uh, the fields are famous for their poppies that grow there like the blood of those, uh, the blood of the fallen. Uh, they commemorate the war dead. They have a strong association with that. Uh, they're often arranged in churches with laurel leaves that symbolize victory uh, in adversity. Uh, they would be mixed with rosemary, for instance, rosemary for remembrance, uh, and ivy leaves. Ivy leaves, uh, the ivy plant, is a, is, stands for faithfulness because it clings closely to what it grows up. The ivy is a sort of clinging uh, plant. Uh, you remember that these associations of plants with, with ideas or virtues, the language of flowers is a very ancient uh, tradition. It appears famously with Ophelia in Hamlet, uh, where she goes through the list of flowers. Here's rosemary, that's for remembrance and what have you. Um, but it's a, an ancient tradition, and we saw how it pops up a little bit in the Middle Ages there with the strawberry and various other flowers that have these relig uh, religious associations to them. The flowers themselves in churches can be arranged in all sorts of creative ways. It's limitless. There are various associations. There's an American Guild of Flower Arrangements, of Church Flower Arrangers. There's the Church of England Guild of Flower Arrangers with their own little website and magazines. Uh, and if you're interested in that, you can look it up. It's, a, it's a, an internet rabbit hole. Uh, you're going to see a, a whole group of very worthy people telling you how to arrange your flowers in church. So long, as I said, that they don't overwhelm the thing that they're supposed to be drawing attention to. We're seeing time and time again, the elements of the liturgy are there not for their own sake. They're there for very specific reasons and purposes even if the reason that they're there is beauty. Beauty and goodness in Greek go together. And the beauty of these ephemeral things uh, uh, is, can, can be there for their own sake too, but they mustn't be used to overwhelm the thing that they're drawing attention to. And here's something we need to remember, their smell can often be as important as their color 
and their shape. They add a dimension of smell to that sense as we come into church for worship too. I think it's good to keep them as seasonal as you possibly can, so that uh, spring flowers look good in spring, uh, chrysanthemums look best in the fall. Uh, it's a bit like, you know, buying certain fruits or vegetables completely out of season. You know, you associate chestnuts, for instance, with the fall, or uh, strawberries with June, and asparagus with May. Uh, certain tastes, certain things taste better and look better at certain times of year. That's not to say that you can't, you can't use them at other times of year, or that you can't use exotic flowers that uh, you don't know when they bloom. I've got no idea where these, when these Chinese lilies bloom like that. I don't know what season they come from in their own country, but here they are to represent the liturgical color of the season. So the colors are going to pick out those liturgical colors. So at Pentecost churches are often decorated with red and yellow and orange flowers to symbolize the flames of the Holy Spirit uh, that descended on the heads of the apostles at the birth of the church. Um, here you can see a carpet of flowers that's used for various uh, fancy occasions uh, in, uh, in Anglican churches and in Roman Catholic churches too. Perhaps it's used in Lutheran churches. But these flowers are arranged very carefully on the, um, in the nave of the church, running up to the altar. And uh, it's a common tradition to do this at Corpus Christi, which is the Sunday that follows Trinity Sunday, I believe. And you would process with a monstrance and with the, with the, with the, with the host inside it. So the procession actually walks over these flowers that have been so carefully prepared and messes them all up. It's a way of honoring um, like those imperial processions of the ancient world and the great medieval processions where people strew flowers in front of the person or thing to be honored. Uh, here it's the church's um, patronal festival dedicated to St. Paul and they have this great procession uh, down the church's aisle at the beginning of the service. In some churches I've seen, uh, they, they do it, say, for the consecration of a bishop, although in St. John the Divine you'd need to massacre quite a lot of flowers to be able to even produce something quite tiny. Maybe just a little thread of rose petals would do. Um, so the flowers often highlight the nature of the service that's going to be celebrated. So harvest festival with pumpkins and wheat sheaves and autumnal flowers. Our Bastille Day celebrations with, uh, with red, white and blue flowers. Here we go. Uh, sometimes arranged like fireworks uh, like this. It's drawing attention to the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. <laughs> Although you can't read it, I've, I've broken one of the, my own rules that I just made. Perhaps we'll have to think again. Um, and uh, Afrique Fet, with the colours of the flags of, of, uh, of Africa, with, uh, with the leaves and the flowers that evoke that particular celebration. So they can be about a celebration in the church as well as related to the liturgical season or uh, something along those lines. Here it's drawing attention to the Teze Cross. <laughs> Finally, funeral flowers. Um, it would be hard to imagine a funeral without flowers. Uh, white lilies tend to be uh, the traditional thing, sometimes in the form of a cross, but many other arrangements of, uh, of flowers are used in funeral services, in funeral tributes. Now, I don't know about America because I haven't done a sort of equivalent funerals in America, but in England, um, they're sometimes called love's last gift. You've bought them for the dead person that you, that you love, and it's the last present that you're going to give them. Sometimes they can be arranged in rather unfortunate ways, like this particular flower arrangement here. Obviously, it's extremely well-meaning, and it's, you're in no doubt about who it's for, and you're in no doubt about who has given it. I remember uh, doing various funerals, especially in London and in Birmingham, uh, where people would spend a fortune on these things and arrange them in such complicated and elaborate ways. Uh, and 
finally you can see on this slide, they would often choose either a religious symbol. Here on the left, you've got the pearly gates to, of heaven uh, in white carnations with red roses to symbolize that this person has now passed on to heaven. On the right-hand side, Irene was a bit of a beer lover. Uh, so the tradition was to make an arrangement of flowers that would symbolize the thing that the person was most fond of. So I've done funerals uh, where there have been um, flowers in the, uh, in the arrangement of the pet dog, uh, flowers in the arrangement of their favorite armchair uh, with an ashtray on one side, uh, and a, a telecommand, a, a remote control for the television on the other arm of the armchair. Uh, I once did one, I couldn't make it out at all uh, what it was. It looked like a, a fried egg. Um, and I thought, well, I'm going to have to get up into the pulpit and preach from there so I get an aerial view of it because I can't see what it is. And I climbed up and it was a boxer. Uh, uh, with boxing gloves and, and yellow shorts, yellow boxing shorts uh, that was placed on top of the coffin. Uh, so clearly the person was a keen boxer who had, who had died. Uh, I sometimes wanted to do a book, a, a photography book about these arrangements called Love's Last Gift and go around and interview the people uh, that had chosen a bingo card or a motorcycle uh, or a boxer or a, or a bottle of beer and tell me the story of that person and why they'd chosen that particular arrangement for them. Uh, here you can see them very often at the, on the side of roads uh, where, you know, somebody has been killed in a car crash and a little car, uh, cross has been erected with, with flowers around it. So there's a very strong association uh, between flowers and death as are, love's last gift. Are they usually taken to the cemetery? After the, this, this composition, these arrangements? Yes, they, they, they the would be taken to the cemetery. Uh, they would uh, be then, uh, if, if, if it was a cremation, the major flower arrangement would stay on top of the, on top of the coffin uh, during the cremation, so would obviously be, be cremated with, with, uh, with the person. Uh, but then, uh, all of any, if there were any other floral tributes, they would be taken outside and uh, lined up so that people could look at them and read the cards that were inside them. For a burial, uh, the flowers would be placed on the top of the grave at the end of the, uh, of, of the burial, or, or lined up by the open grave before the burial took place. I've noticed a new tradition has arisen, I don't know how new it is, perhaps it's not so new, uh, of people, all the mourners at a graveside, uh, if once the, uh, once the coffin has been lowered into the ground, people no longer throw a handful of earth onto the grave, uh, they throw flowers in there instead. It really, is yeah. that more of a French tradition I don't too? Know. I've always done that for my grandparents, uh, hmm. it was usually throwing flowers, roses. Yeah. yeah. In England, the, the tradition was to throw a little handful of earth mm. on the person so that you could help to bury them, uh, to lay them to rest. Uh, the priest would t t take a handful of earth and say, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, mm. dust to just dust in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life. So uh, instead of all your friends getting together with shovels, uh, to help bury you and put you to rest, uh, you would throw a little handful of symbolic earth over the over the coffin. But perhaps it's more effective to throw a flower down. I don't know. It's a it's a very graphic way of of describing what you're doing. Perhaps a very strong liturgical uh, element to it. Well, I think that's all I've got on flowers for the moment. Can I ask you? A yes, question, yes, please do. What um, love's last gift would you like? Uh, for mine? Uh, I don't know. Ah, that's a very good question. Um, uh, maybe some knitting needles. <laughs> yep. Or, uh, I don't know, the flowers themselves. 
uh, a, a priest's collar in white <laughs> carnations. <laughs> yes, or a British flag. <laughs> How awful, that would be absolutely dreadful. Um, yes, I think a, a, a simple arrangement of white flowers would be perfect. <laughs> I, and I think also it depends on the time of year that it happens. Um, f for my mother's arrangement for the top of her uh, coffin, I asked for all spring flowers because she particularly liked the spring flowers and grew them. Uh, so it was full of daffodils and irises and hy uh, hyacinths and various other different things. Um, as opposed to the standard white lily in the form of a cross uh, that, that's very often chosen for funerals. Um, and people commented on it, actually, and they said, oh, that's very very much like your mother. Uh, that's uh, full of spring and, and life. Yeah. And many children were there, too, and people that she taught with and uh, at the school where she was a headmistress. So it sort of seemed appropriate for the time. But have a think about it. That could be a, a good uh, a good question. Good. Well, if you have any comments, any questions, or you'd like further information on something, just leave a comment down below, uh, and we'll monitor it and uh, reply in the comments. Thanks. Well, it's eight thirty. Are there any other concluding remarks we want to make? I'll leave you with four Christmas trees. <laughs> <laughs> For uh, in, a, in clearly what is a Baroque church, you can spot that now, can't you? Because uh, it's a, um, a stage setting for this. Yeah. I mean, it works well. I have to say. No? Yes, it does. It fits in with the uh, with the decor, generally yeah, with the speaking. Huge columns and everything. With the columns at the back. Yep. Yeah. It's not scandalous in its taste. No, no, <laughs> no. We're sort of flirting with it. Yeah. Not quite there. <laughs> Let us pray if you want. Yes, I think uh, Joris has got a prayer for us to finish off. Nous te rendons grâce, Dieu Tout-Puissant, pour la terre fertile qui produit tout ce qui est nécessaire à la vie des hommes et à ta louange. Bénis ceux qui travaillent au champ et donne-leur un temps favorable. Accorde-nous d'avoir part aux fruits et aux fleurs de la terre, et de proclamer ta grande bonté. Sois toujours avec tes serviteurs, qui dans l'art et la musique cherchent à enrichir la louange de ton peuple ici-bas. Fais-leur entrevoir dès maintenant la beauté, et rends-les dignes de la contempler, enfin dans ta perfection pour l'éternité. Par Jésus-Christ, notre Seigneur. Amen. Amen.